There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves. Conquered by Babylon, living in exile, far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story. How they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Um, they didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the Promised Land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, it wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more, no matter where you live. Yeah, I, I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, and tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Now Israel's scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. Yeah, Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed in the stranger, he said God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus also claimed that Israel and all humanity had lost its way, that our self-centeredness drives us to create false homes based on status and power, and these inevitably exclude others. We live in an exile of our own making. But Jesus said the true way home is one of weakness, of service, and of forgiveness. And then, Jesus went into exile alongside us to show us the true way home. Which is? Well, Jesus said he is the way. His life and self-giving love proved more powerful than humanity's failure. He opened up a pathway to our real home. And as Jesus' followers committed themselves to him, they discovered this new way of being human. They believed that the real return from exile had begun. And so they would call themselves sojourners or wanderers. Oh, right. They would say things like, the world isn't our home and we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. All right. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I, uh, I've almost decided that... <laughs> 
that this passage, the Lord's just going to have me camp here until I'm dead. And and that's kind of an unusual thing for me. It, it, you know, it's, it's one thought and move on. And it's definitely unusual in the world in which we live in. There's not a lot of preachers anymore who plumb to the depths of a passage or a book the way that we've been doing Peter. And I, I really um, think that the Lord is trying to teach us here on multiple levels. And I may have mentioned this last week, but I want to mention it again. Read scripture slowly. Let the Lord really speak to you about a, just even one word, one phrase in a passage. And don't run to the next verse. Read over that thing. I know a, a testimony of a person that um, was having some family difficulties. And um, it was the daughter struggling with her parents and some decisions that they'd made while she was growing up. Not sinful necessarily, but just decisions. And was very angry and very um, hurt by some of those decisions and the, the attitudes that their parents carried towards her. And so I challenged her to read the, the, prodigals, the parable of the prodigal son for two weeks every day. And not to, you know, read through it, close her Bible, but to actually wait for the Lord to speak to her through that. And after the end of that two weeks, she says, I'm not done reading yet. I feel, really feel like the Lord's just now started to do a work in me out of this passage of Scripture. And while the, the, the relationship was not restored in the sense that everything was, you know, gumdrops and, and lollipops, there was definitely movement on both sides as, as one of them took Scripture at its face and let it speak to them and change them on a deep, deep level. So, anyway, I said all of that to say that we're still in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 9. And this idea of, of exile has just gripped me, and, I've, and, I, and I haven't been able to let go of it. And I, it, just the world in which we live, and the, the craziness that's going on, and how do we live a Christian life in that? And we talked about that up until this time, Peter has done a lot of theory, and now he's getting ready to turn to actual ways of taking that theory and living it in, in his people's lives. But this way of the exile that, we, that we've talked about the last couple of weeks is just, I just haven't been able to get away from it. Anytime I'm not formally doing something for writing or, or teaching or something like that, this is where my mind's at. I've, I haven't even been able to read some other stuff that I had on my, my desk that people have asked me to read or comment on or whatever. I've, I've just been so consumed with this idea. The way of the exile. How are we to live as Christians in this world that we're living in? The chaos, the, the fear, the anxiety, the stress. How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to process the news? How are we supposed to process society? How are we supposed to process ourselves? How are we supposed to move forward as a church when everything has been jumbled? I had a conversation with a pastor this week about the idea that he's in his particular location that they've still not let the church open up and he doesn't necessarily feel comfortable doing Facebook. He doesn't feel comfortable doing Zoom for small groups. And, and, I, and I've challenged him that it doesn't matter whether you feel comfortable or not, because the process is exactly the same. Now, those superficial things, gathering in a building versus being on Facebook, gathering at someone's home or versus being on Zoom, the things that we're trying to accomplish are exactly the same. And the exact same things can happen. People can invite others to watch Facebook. They can share the, the, the um, data about how to get on Zoom. So you're still inviting people. It's still the same. It just manifests itself in a little different way. So all of that, let's read our passage in 1 Peter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, I, t I, I keep asking myself, if Peter uses this word exile, what does he mean? What is, why are we really in exile? What does it mean to be in exile? That, that's where I'm at with, with this struggle. And I heard someone say uh, over in the last few days that we need God in America again. And while that's true, I, I guess, it's a truism, but it's true, but what does that mean? What, what are they trying to say when they, when they say that? And for me, my, my struggle with that kind of saying is this, very simply. The church and Christians are known by what we stand against. We stand against homosexuality. We stand against abortion. We take a stand against that. We take a stand against that. We take a stand against that. We preach about all these big social issues that we're against. We go to court over them. We vote for this politician or that politician. And I would suggest, in building on last week's message, and if you haven't watched it, find it here in the Facebook feed or go to our website, that building on last week's message, that those kind of things keep us stuck in this world. If we are to be living as exiles, if we're sojourners, we're passing through, we need to look at the world differently. So anytime I use the word exile, that is shorthand for this idea. We see the world differently. We are sojourners. We have not put down roots. We have not accepted the way that this world around us operates. We are passing through that. And I would also suggest that the real issue in America is that we have not taken seriously that we bear the name of Christ. And I'm going to really get in your grill right now. It is not the courts that bear the name of Christ. It is not Congress that bears the name of Christ. It is the church where Christ dwells by his spirit. That is where Christ needs to come into America again. The church. We, 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 we've, uh, we've said that the court can fight our battles. We've said that Congress can fight our battles, that the president can fight our battles. Instead of turning to the one who said, I am your, your, your shield of faith. I am your, your, your defender. I am your one who's going to lead you through this thing. We've looked everywhere except to the one who said that I will be your defender. So... I want us to look at an Old Testament message in, in the book of Amos. I'm going to turn to chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 18. It says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I hate your feast and take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This is heavy duty stuff. So let's start right there at the very beginning of the passage. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. What is Amos trying to see, get us to see here? So many times we, we've prayed, Lord, come. We, we want you to come. And that's a real prayer and that's a good prayer. But sometimes as Christians, I think we're, we pray that from a very selfish place. We think that, the, that when the Lord comes, everything is going to be right for me. That everything is going to be okay for me. My tribulation, my suffering, my angst over what's going on is going to be over. And Amos would have us examine and look at really what it means for the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord comes, it is going to be awful. 
It is going to be just so cataclysmic, so apocalyptic, so everything off the chart that our words begin to fail us with how bad it's going to be. And yet, oh, we want the day of the Lord to come. You realize that when the author of the play walks on the stage, the play is over. When the day of the Lord happens, judgment comes. Not just for the sinner, but for the saint as well. Yes, the world will be set right according to the, the righteousness and the judge of judgment of God. But he says, it's darkness, it's not light. It's as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met, met him. In other words, they go from one bad thing to a, another bad thing. Or he went into his own house and he thinks everything's cool, but the serpent bit him. Things are not going to be as you think they're going to be on that day. It is going to be horrifically awful. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for the Lord's day, because what does it say at the end of Revelation? Come, Lord Jesus, even so come. With the Spirit and the Bride, we say come. I, I understand that we are supposed to pray for the day of the Lord to arrive. But I want that to be balanced with us not looking at it as a selfish thing. That is, we're exiling through this life, as we're sojourning through this life, that we don't miss this moment that we live in, looking for something over there, thinking it's going to be better over there. It is the day of the Lord is darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it. This next passage, the next part of the passage, he even gets even further into our lives. He says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. He, he's not talking to the world here. He's talking to his chosen people. He's talking to those who would say that, that they bear his name. I, I take no delight when you gather together, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. And if you don't know the way that the sacrificial system was set up and how it prefigures our lives for today, you need to go and, and find the, the passages in, the, in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You need to think about how our lives shape. There are several good books about how that those are types for our lives. But the burnt offerings would be the, sa the sacrifice of sin that, that, that took their sin away. And then the grain offerings were the joyous times, the things that they gave because they wanted just to simply worship the Lord. He says, I will not accept your asking for forgiveness. I will not accept your praise. I will not look upon them. We live in this, this, this age of the church being so self-righteous that I don't do that. I preach against that. I don't do that. But we do not take that next step. We, we all the time define repentance as a turning away from something. And that's an all right definition, I suppose. But the implication is, is not just that we turn from doing X, whatever you want to put X as is the sin, to turn from that, what are we turning towards? See, the church defines itself by so many things that it does not do. And I would suggest that the church needs to quit defining itself by what it does not do and start defining itself by the things it does, about who it is, what it is called into being for. It's not to make noise. It's not to have great worship services. It's not to gather in a building. It's not to be able to hoop and holler and see people healed, as awesome as that is. It's not, awesome. it's not to be able to speak in tongues, as awesome as that is. It's not to be able to tithe, as awesome as that is. It's not to be able to have the latest and greatest sound equipment and, and projection, all, as great as that is. It's not even to be able to be able to stream onto Facebook, as awesome as that is. The day of the Lord is coming. And as people who are sojourning, looking for that day, we, we anticipate that it's going to come. But in the now, if the day of the Lord is coming, and he says it's going to be dark, it's going to be awful, it's going to be brutal, how are we to live as we get and go to that place? But let justice 
roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. So justice, this is the action or the practice or the obligation of awarding each person his just due. That's the easy definition I came up with. And the problem with that is the idea of just due is not the biblical concept of justice. The biblical concept of justice, let me, let me back up. Let's talk about truth for a moment. Truth has to do with what is. When we say something is true, we talk about it in real terms. We talk about it in accurate terms. We talk about it in actual terms. And, and we, we sometimes move those kind of concepts into justice. But justice has to do with the way things ought to be. I mean, you think about things like human trafficking. You think about things like poverty. When you think about things like racial inequality. The reason why we say we want justice is there is because the truth is, is that those things exist, but the way things ought to be is that they should not exist. So it's not the idea that each one gets his just due, because if that's the case, then people that have made decisions that have opened up the possibility of these things in their lives should be getting what they have. The person that's committed a crime that has done their prison sentence has gotten his just due if we accept the worldly definition of justice. But if we accept the biblical idea of justice of what ought to be or restoration of what ought to be, then we see this passage in a very different light. We see this passage talking about justice rolling down like water, that things are being restored to the way they ought to be. That the church is actively helping people be everything that God wants them to be, the fullness of the image of God in their life. The church should be the one combating poverty. The church should be the one combating racial inequality. The church should be taking the lead on any kind of, of destruction of the image of, of humanity in ourselves. It's not up to the government. It's not up to courts. Now, it's awesome when they get involved, but the church shouldn't be waiting for them or to be depending upon them. We should not be taking our cues from them. If justice is the idea that we are restoring people to the way things ought to be, the way God created them, lifting them up out of sin and, and right, unrighteousness, oh, if we could just grasp what it means to be just. Likewise, with righteousness, we, we talk about morality. But again, I think that that's so short of what the biblical definition of righteousness is. Righteousness in the, the biblical sense is the, the idea that you are upright, which is far more than just morality. The Good Samaritan was upright. Now, the Pharisee that passed by, the Levi that passed by, they were morally right. They were looking out to stay away from uncleanness. But the virtue, the honor, the uprightness of the Samaritan proved he was righteous. I, I, would, I would want you to think about what are you doing in your life to affect justice for the people around you? If the way of the exile, if, if the idea that we are sojourning, passing through, looking for the kingdom of God to manifest itself in our life, and that day we're looking to is going to be when God sets all accounts right, why are we waiting till that day? Why are we not bringing the kingdom of God into this moment and helping settle and restore all accounts right now? Why are we waiting for that day? Or why are we expecting the government, the courts, some law? to set things right. God has called the church to be just. The God has called the church to be upright. And he's not just said that, oh, do it once and you're done. He says, let it flow like waters. Let it, let it be like an ever-flowing stream. Now, I had the privilege of growing up on a river. 
And it was wonderful to be able to go canoeing or swimming or fishing or, you know, all the things that you can do with water. But it was so amazing. It was so amazing that you would get into August of the year and, and the river would go way down. And, and there were spots where you couldn't canoe any longer, that it would, it would get so that you, your boat would drag on the gravel bed. And then we would get into November, December, January, and the, the winter rains would come, and it would rise up. And I've seen that river get out of its banks. I've seen it where there was one place where it come, come close to the highway, where it actually washed the highway out one time. It was so strong in, in its current. It was so strong in its force. And I, and I, and I cannot help but think about that, the force of that river, In our current circumstances, the chaos of the world in which we live, we say, Lord, rain down on us. But what do we really mean when we say that? If we're honest enough to say that the, that the church is like the river there where it's so shallow that we have to drag our canoes over the top of it. We say, Lord, come down, rain on us again. What is it going to look like when he does rain? If we take this kind of passage at its face value, it's not so that we can have better services. It's not so that we can have better buildings. It's not so that we can have the better whatever material thing there is. No, when God rains down, he wants the force of that river to rise up and be just and be righteous and be changing people's lives and be in their lives. Yes, <laughs> let's be honest. We, the church at times needs your money. But the church needs you as a person more than it needs your money. It needs you praying. It needs you showing up for events. It needs you volunteering at things like Hope Kitchen and the Help Center and Restoration Life Center and wherever you're at, whatever kind of ministry that it is. It needs you going across your, your fence and mowing your neighbor's yard. It needs you to be a, a mom and dad to that mom and dad that, didn't have one. It needs you to move beyond just sitting in your chair and you becoming grandma and grandpa to those kids down the street. Everybody talks about how the kids are unruly, but nobody will step in and show them how to live a different life. The Christian life is not something that is just given to us by God. It's also learned by imitating others. And if you are not putting yourself in a place to be imitated, you are like these people that Amos was talking about. I hate, I despise your feast. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. We need to move past our own self-righteousness and see the goodness that God has given us so that we can impart that goodness to others. This passage here, talking about truth and, 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 and righteousness, talking about us active in, in doing and being the church, reminds me of that phrase there in John where it talks about that Jesus tabernacled amongst them and truth and grace was there. If God gave each one of us our just due, none of us would stand before him. But he doesn't do that. He gives us grace. We love the idea of grace for me. But the whole world is crying for grace. The whole world is crying for justice. The whole world is crying for righteousness. Do not sit in your pew. Do not sit in your easy chair. And say that you're just. And that you're righteous. And that you're full of grace. Because Amos would tell you that you may not be. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and we give you thanks for your word. I pray that you would help each one of us to, to examine our own hearts. But not just examine in the sense to say, oh Lord, woe is me. But then that second step 
of repentance would take place. It's not just what we do not do, Lord. Help us to see the reality that the church is what we do. And so, Lord, I pray that you would minister to us about the things going on in this world, that there are places for the church to stand up and rise and be who you've called us to be. And not just the church in the sense of a whole congregation, but each one of us can do our part in our neighborhood, in our community, around the people who are with us. And that you would change us to be able to change the world. Lord, we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for your goodness is great and it is forever. We do pray that you would come. But until that day, we're going to keep sojourning, walking in this way that we call the church a Christian being your body. We just give you the praise, honor, and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.